Hey, I'm Serenity and this is my channel and today we're joined by Clover and Nova. You can't really see Clover, but he is literally right here. And welcome back to another Hometown Horrors. Today we are going to be talking about a very interesting case because it is almost 40 years old, but it's fascinating because a friend kills his best friend's entire family and we will never know the reason why. This case was really fascinating to me because about two weeks ago I was researching for more Hometown Horror topics and I came across like one local radio station article on this case and I felt down a rabbit hole. So this is really interesting. Before we go any further, I do want to mention there are timestamps down below. Please, 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 please use them if you want to. As always, I just recommend stopping at the disclaimers and trigger warning. So let's get into it. Hometown Horrors is a series on my channel. I grew up on true crime and have always been fascinated by why people do what they do, the whole nature versus nurture aspect. Hometown Horrors is basically where I take a true crime case based in my hometown county. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, sister city to Sinidad Juarez, Mexico. There's this insane phenomenon where Juarez, Mexico is one of the most dangerous cities in the world, often ranked in the top 10 on the yearly analysis list. And until three years ago, El Paso, Texas was ranked one of the safest cities in America. That was before an outsider with an extreme hate for Hispanics came in and massacred 23 people. El Paso has yet to make it back onto that yearly safest cities in America list yet. No matter how safe a city may be, there are always crimes being committed. As someone who grew up in the city and knows the ins and outs, who can tell you exactly where parts of crimes have taken place and what parts of town are dangerous, I believe I have this insider knowledge which I'd be able to bring to these cases with a certain perspective. As I said, El Paso was one of the safest cities in America for years, so there would only be so many criminal cases I am able to cover before I completely ran out. Thus, I will also be covering cases from surrounding areas, including Juarez, Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Horizon, Texas, Chapadab, New Mexico, and other surrounding areas I have been to and am very familiar with. Before we go any further, I just want to give trigger warnings for the following. Murder and family death. There are a couple more that go in there, but I think that is just like the basis that covers it all. If any of these topics you believe you'd be unable to study Stomach, please stop watching, put yourself first, and I'll see you at a later date with a different video. If I get any information wrong, please kindly let me know down below. I tried my best to get the following information as accurately as possible. However, I did use multiple different sources, and if only one source mentioned a certain aspect of a detail, but another source didn't, I went with the most commonly reported aspect. Sources will all be linked down below. I tried to use only respected websites. If I'm looking off to the side at all, it's because I have my script loaded here on my iPad. If I didn't have my script, I'd go off topic constantly and forget important details. Lastly, this video is an informational research study that I am sharing for academic entertainment reasons only. I mean absolutely no harm to anyone mentioned, especially the victim and the victim's family. So grab a blanket, a snack, a drink. Yes, we have another color Stanley today. And let's get into the video. The year was 1986, over 37 years ago. The Castro Arena family lived at 201 Alicia Drive in the central lower valley area of El Paso, Texas, right off of Fox Plaza in a low income housing development. The family consisted of four people. The children were 15 year old Fabian Castorena, his younger sister, 11-year-old Ruby Castorena, and their parents, mother, 35-year-old Luz Elena Castorena, and father, 36-year-old Raul Castorena. The family was quiet, according to neighbors and their own family. They were hardworking and they kept to themselves. Jose Castorena was attending school at the University of Texas at El Paso, or UTEP, as it's more commonly known, as an engineer major, and he was taking a few courses at a time. He was actually almost finished with his schooling in order to earn his degree and hopefully better his family's life. Luz was a housewife as far as it is reported. She took care of the kids. She was a homemaker, stay-at-home mom, and she did the household chores, which is a full-time job in itself. The family's quiet life changed completely in the first week of March 1986. On March 8th, 1986, all four family members were found dead in their home after calls from other family members went unanswered. The extended family was really worried about the Castorena, so they called police. Police then arrived on scene to find each of the Castorena family shot in the head, each in a different room of the small home. Authorities were puzzled why this would happen to the family of the Castorenas. While the extended family grieved, the investigators got straight to work. A few days after the bodies were discovered, a suspect was actually taken into custody. The alleged murder weapon was actually found in the home of a friend of the suspect. The weapon was a 12 gauge pump action shotgun. It would later be revealed that this friend of the suspect who was harboring the alleged murder weapon actually sold the suspect killer shotgun shells days before the murders. I know I've repeatedly been saying the suspect, but that's because what I'm about to say is going to shock you. The suspect was a 15 year old boy named Jesus Soterio Jr. He attended Henderson Junior High as an honor student who played the violin in
in the school band. Henderson Junior High is still there to this day. It's just now called Henderson Middle School and it actually is a sixth through eighth grade school. Now I was trying to figure it out why that in if in the 80s if Henderson was a sixth through ninth grade school because Jesus was 15 and so was Fabian which would make them in the ninth grade. It might be but it's not a big detail to the story. So here is where the bigger shock comes in. Besides the killer being a 15 year old child, Jesus Sotero Jr. was actually the best friend of one of the victims, 15 year old Fabian Casorena, one of the people he was accused of ending the life of. Just days after the bodies of the family of four were found, police questioned the suspect Jesus. This is when they discovered his relationship to one of the victims, Fabian. The pair went to school together and walked home together every day. Neighbors said they were both quiet boys that never caused any trouble and really didn't talk to anyone else. They mostly just kept to themselves. As police were questioning Jesus Santero, they observed some traces of blood dried onto his shoes. Jesus's motive for the killings was never made public until the trial. The trial began in November of 1986. Jesus was now 16 years old and was set to stand trial as an adult. However, because of his age, the maximum penalty he could receive was a life term, not the death penalty. A testimony from a juvenile probation officer at the detention hearing for Jesus Sotero was released when the officer named Jerry Dryton testified that Jesus had told homicide detectives that he, and I quote, killed Fabian after Fabian killed his mother, father, and sister. Apparently during interrogations, he had given the detectives three different stories of what happened that night. Before the trial, it was reported in the newspaper that Fabian told the detectives that his friend Fabian asked him to shoot him, so he did, ending his life. The three stories he told detectives went as followed. In one version of what happened, Jesus told detectives that the Mexican Mafia, aka the Juarez Cartels, called him to tell him to leave his shoes, a shotgun, and shotgun shells near a dumpster, and it would all be linked back to him. In another version of what happened, Jesus Sotero said that Fabian had told him to come by his house on a certain day at a certain time and pick up the shotgun and the evidence and go back out the back door. In the last version, he said that Fabian showed his friend the bodies of his own family and then showed Jesus and told Jesus to kill him, which Jesus then did. The assertion that he made claiming Fabian killed his own family and then showed Jesus the bodies was contradicted by statements he himself made. Jesus had told police that Luz, the mother, had been shot twice, a detail that wasn't known by anyone until after the autopsy report was done, which means he would have had to have been in the home when she was shot. Otherwise, he wouldn't have known that she had been shot twice. Like I said earlier, each of the victims was actually shot in the head at least once, but the autopsies revealed that Luz had been shot twice. Jesus Santorio testified that after he shot his friend in the chest, he had asked him to shoot him again in order to end his life, claiming that Fabian was still alive after the first shot, but that was not possible. According to the forensic pathologist who testified that Fabian's death was instantaneous after he was shot in the chest. Fabian also suffered from a head wound, the shot in the head that all four of the family members obtained. Jose Castorena was shot once in the jaw and Luz was hit twice, once in the shoulder and once in the left side of the head. The youngest of the victims, Ruby, was shot once in the left side of the head and lost a portion of her finger as she raised her hand in front of her in self-defense. She was 11 years old and trying to save her own life. Friends and family of Jesus all claimed that he was a good kid, a good student, a quiet child that just couldn't have done something like this. All of El Paso was in shock. These were two best friends, both in band, both with good grades, both in honor classes, and staying out of trouble. They could be seen at any point of the week on their way home from school with their instruments and books in tow, or riding together on their bikes somewhere. In the days leading up to the murders, both boys were said to have been acting normal with no indications of any trouble. During the initial investigation, prints from two drinking glasses that were found in Fabian Castorena's bedroom were taken into evidence that turned out to match Jesus's fingerprints that were found on the glass. That kind of evidence might not be very damning considering the boys were two best friends and it would make absolute sense for prints to be on there any day of the week. If Jesus was coming into the Castorena house, hanging out, his fingerprints could possibly be found anywhere in the house. But some damning evidence was that there were bloody footprints found in the hallway and Jesus's shoes that were 
spotted with dried blood during his initial investigation that matched. They matched. Nothing appeared to be missing from the Castorena home. Both Fabian's room and his parents' master bedroom were ransacked with the dresser drawers in the master bedroom found on the floor. The blood that was found on Jesus' shoes was particularly damning as evidence, like I said, especially since he gave several explanations as to why that blood was on his shoes in the first place when detectives noticed it. He claimed that something had spilled on him in lab class. His brother threw up on them and he even said that a gangster had borrowed the shoes from him and then asked Jesus, after giving these shoes back to him, to dispose of them somewhere. But I guess he just decided to keep these shoes because they were his? I don't know. That one doesn't even make sense. Like I said, the shoes were actually tested and the results were positive for blood and the bloody footprints found in the hallway of the Castorina family home matched the shoe prints of the shoes. So it was some pretty key evidence to the case. An autopsy showed that the Castorena family was likely killed on March 6th and their bodies weren't found until March 8th. Prosecutor Tom Bernstein said the family all fell to their death in quick succession. And I quote, he said, this happened so fast, this little girl Ruby didn't have time to drop the candy in her hand, he said during closing arguments. What you have here is a man who went into the house that night and killed four people in cold blood. Jesus's defense attorney, Dolph Quijano, agreed that the state's most damning evidence was a pair of blue and white Nike sneakers with the sole pattern matching the bloody footprints found in the apartment. Jesus Sotero was wearing them the night police questioned him and dark stains on the sneakers already tested positive for blood. But the sneakers didn't show a fine mist of blood that should have been there had they been worn during the shooting, Dahl claimed. The trial ended that same year. On November 21st, 1986, just a couple months after the murders happened, Jesus Soterio Jr. was found guilty at the age of 16 for the murders of the Casarena family of four. He was sentenced to life in prison, the maximum sentence he could receive. Family members on both sides of the case declined comment after the verdict and Soterio showed no emotion. Jesus's attorneys indicated that they would appeal the decision. A few years after Jesus Terio Jr. was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, an article started showing up in the local newspaper by El Paso Times that said there was a possibility that he could be getting a new trial altogether. There is nothing else reported on this case after the trial in regards to Jesus Terio Jr. For all we know, he could be spending the rest of his life in prison to this day. Jesus Terio Jr. would be 52 years old this year. Either way, the true motive motive for what happened that day between two best friends has never been discovered, so we may never know what caused a 15-year-old honor student to murder his best friend and his family, but even if we did, it wouldn't change what happened. Also, a lot of news reports like to say that Fabian and Jesus did this together. We may never know if that's true, but I choose not to believe that because who would do that? Who would ask their friends to do that? To me, it seems definitely like Jesus did this on his own. Why? Like I said, we will never know. Jesus could also, to this day, be out on the street. There is no news reporting of it after the trial ended. That is all the information I have on this case. Please let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. I I don't even know what to think because it's jarring. It was a 15 year old kid who annihilated his best friend's family. It, it's just shocking. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if you have any case requests down below. As always, for a palette cleanser, the doggo picture of the day is this picture of, of course, it's always Nova. When is it not Nova? She she likes to play with my pillows. She is a nap queen, as you can tell. This girl loves a good nap. All right, love you, mean it kisses. Don't you think stupid, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.